Um, we're glad that you're here, and if you're here, and we're also glad. Don't you love living in Hawaii? Yeah, kind of? Okay. That, that was really subpar. <laughs> I, I've lived here for 20 years, and i got to tell you, one of the funnest things about being here is sharing with people all the very unique things that are here, things that have made a difference in my life, that have made a significant impact, and things that I honestly, at this point in my life, I care about. You know, I mean, some things like restaurants, uh, some of my favorite beaches on the North Shore and on the east side here, uh, some of my favorite places to hike and to walk, um, and, and just the fact that I've, I've lived here for almost two decades now, and I still am blown away by the blue skies here. Now, I'm from L.A. Skies are not blue in L.A. They're, they're not. Birds don't sing in L.A. Birds complain. Birds actually sing out here in Honolulu. It's just amazing. And I love the opportunity to be able to share all the things that have made such an impact on my life and that I, I don't really care about at this point. Aren't you like that? And, I mean, we really are, right? All of us are like that. We, we want to communicate with other people about the things that have made a difference that we care about, and we want them to be able to experience those same type of things. The, uh, the other day, I was in the doctor's office, and I saw the person that was helping me. I don't think she was my age, but she was, you know, getting up there toward my age, and she had a, a folder of some guys from BTS, uh, you would have known it had you, you not known BTS. And so I, I just thought I'd play a joke on her and just say, oh, man, are you into that group? And she was like, she kind of covered it up real quick, you know. And then I said, I'm, I'm just joking. I, I like that group too. My daughter turned me on to BTS. And so I recognized that J-Hope was on the folder. And, she, and when I said that, she started preaching to me the gospel of, of BTS. Oh, my gosh. She started telling me about a concert that she went to and you got to go. And you, in order for you to really get the experience, you got to do X, Y, and Z. And, I, and at, at a certain point, I had to go like, okay, <laughs> I'm not as enthusiastic. But the point is that the things that have made a difference in our life and that we care about, we want others to know about that, right? We share those things with other people. For some of us, it's keto or whatever it might be. You, you know, there's something in your life you want other people to experience and to know about, so you share it with other people. Totally natural. I think it's a good thing. I, I do think, though, it is weird that in the one area where it probably matters the most... In this one area where something and really somebody has made a bigger impact in our lives more than anything, oftentimes it feels really uncomfortable and even awkward, so much so that we shy away from sharing with somebody something that has made such an incredible impact in our lives. And we live in a culture and in a world, and I think there are many different reasons why that happens. But don't you think it's funny that when it comes to a relationship with Jesus, like let me just ask you, how many of you has Jesus made an impact in your life? Okay. If you got your hand raised, I'm glad for you. If you don't yet have your hand raised, my, my prayer and my hope is that you would come to experience Jesus the way that many people have, that we have. And, but for those of us who've had that experience, wouldn't that be something that we would want everybody to know about? I mean, I like BTS, but that's way better. Keto has helped some of you, but that is way better. There is, but for some reason, it, it is awkward at times. And what should be natural feels at times unnatural. And so I want to look at this idea. And today I want to talk about this, this, this thing called evangelism. And I know some of you are going like, oh, my gosh, I come to church one Sunday of the year other than Christmas, Easter, and he's talking about evangelism. What the heck? Evangelism is a word that we give to a concept that Jesus calls in the Bible just preaching the gospel, preaching good news, telling people about this incredible good news. This thing that should be such an pr incredible privilege and honor for us to do, for some reason, sometimes feels so uncomfortable and so unnatural that in many times, in many situations, we just back away from doing it. When in every other situation, we're just leaning in to want people to experience what we're experiencing. And so in, in the Bible, as we, as we talk about this, I'm going to use those two words interchangeably. I know when I say evangelism, depending on your church experience, it's just a loaded word, right? For some of you, there's this, oh, no, we're going to pass out flyers or, you know, there's just all kind of baggage that comes with that. We're going to talk to people and mean and tell them how bad they are. There's just all kind of different pictures of that. 
my prayer and my hope today is that God will begin to reshape this instead of some type of heavy burden and obligation into the invitation that it is to join God in what he's already doing. And so here's, here's what happens in the scriptures in the book of John. John is pointing everything to Jesus. And in verse 43, the next day, Jesus decided to go into Galilee. And he found Philip. And he said to Philip, Philip, follow me. And now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found a friend of his named Nathaniel. And he said to him, we have found him. Now, this was a loaded. Philip basically finds his buddy Nathaniel and says, Nathaniel, this is the one that was spoken about, that was written about by Moses. This is the one that we've been waiting for. He says, we found the one whom Moses in the law he wrote about and the prophets they wrote about. It's Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. And I love this because I think it's so funny. Nazareth was a border or, you know, a town that was about five, six miles away from another town called Cana. And so that's where Nathaniel's from is Cana. This is like Kaiser and Kalani, right? And so he, Nathaniel says this. He said, can anything good come out of Kaiser? He went to Kalani, obviously. Basically just saying, like, can anything good come out of that little town, that our rival town? And then Philip said to him, come and see. Come and see. Such simple words, but this idea is so powerful. Come and see. Pray with me as we just uh, take our hearts. Lord, we, God, that, the thought of preaching the gospel or evangelism, it just it, it brings up so many images in us, different ones, some good, some not so good. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to recapture your original intention Lord, what we see happening here with Philip and Nathaniel, and to understand the power of it, God. So we just bring, and I'm just inviting you to bring whatever image, whatever idea or experience you have, just bring it to God. And Lord, that you would reshape, reframe, and help us to have a more Bible-based understanding of what you're inviting us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, we showed this diagram. We've showed it previously. It's our journey, our journey from God in the, the blue dot, God creating everything for his greater purpose, which is that red destination point that we're heading to. And then very soon after God created everything beautiful, perfect for his purpose, we chose, humanity chose to betray our relationship with God. And that opened up the door for sin and death and violence. Pretty much everything that we see and we experience in our world today was open, the door was open for that because of our sin or our moral betrayal, relational betrayal from God. We got a, into a downward spiral, and God did not just reject us when we hit bottom. He didn't reject us. He actually pursued us, and he sent his son Jesus to you and I. Jesus paid a price for you and I so that we could be restored to God, but also restored to our original purpose. In fact, Kaylee celebrated the res restoration to God. She got water baptized. Yeah. Kaylee just finished her, her studies at UH and got her, her undergraduate degree, and that was a celebration, water baptism, a celebration of God doing this miraculous thing on the inside of us, not just changing circumstances of our life, but actually changing the internal parts of our life, and she made that declaration. And what happens with many of us, as we've been talking about, is we get camped out at that green dot, and we're celebrating that for the rest, but God restores us not only to him, he restores us to his purpose, which from the very beginning he set in motion. But the only way that we can go toward God's original purpose is to follow him, is to follow him. So these past weeks we've been talking about where following him leads us. And today I want to finish our series by saying following him, following Jesus, will lead us to ultimately care about what he cares about, to care about what he cares about. Not only does he change us on the inside, he begins to change the desires of our heart, and we begin to desire what is important to him. And so if you were to look at Jesus' life and say, okay, what did Jesus care about? What was Jesus' priority? Well, Jesus summed up his mission. He said this was his mission. The Son of Man come to seek and to save the lost. That is why Jesus came. 
He came to seek and to save the lost. When he talked about the father heart of God and how God responds towards his children, you and I, Jesus gave the story. He says, okay, there's a shepherd who has 100 sheep, and 99 of those sheep are safe, but there's one sheep who wanders away. This is what the shepherd does. The shepherd leaves the 99 who are safe to go after that one and to bring that one back into the family, into the flock. And when that happens... There is celebration, there is a party, because there is more rejoicing over that one sinner that leaves the flock and is restored than the 99 righteous who are safe. The Father's heart is just this heart that wants to see people restored, and there is celebration when that happens. And then, ultimately, Jesus, when he, he's, he's questioned, because these, these guys called the Pharisees, who were, who were religious leaders and teachers, and these guys called uh, lawyers and scribes, they would always try and find some kind of fault with Jesus. And one of the biggest things they found with him was that Jesus was not doing what their oral tradition said was how they were supposed to fulfill the law. He was always breaking their oral tradition for the sake of compassion. The compassion of God overrides the tradition of men is what Jesus was trying to explain to them. And so when they were in fear, they were so angry with him when he would do this and he would break their law and he would heal people on the Sabbath. And they're asking him like, Who, what gives you the right? Why would you do that? Jesus describes why he does that. He explains himself. He says a physician, a doctor, doesn't come to those who are healthy. A, a doctor comes to those who are sick and heals them. He says in the same way, the Son of Man God does not come just for those who are righteous or who think they're righteous, but he comes for the sinner. And the lost are and they were Jesus' highest priority. You are Jesus' highest priority. And to follow Jesus means his priority becomes our priority. Now, that word lost, I think that's really helpful. I mean, that to me is not a, a, a bad word. That really helps me because lost is what we feel when we're away from home. Lost is what we feel when we feel unsafe, when we're in need of rest for who knows how long. That's how we feel. We feel lost. Lost is how we feel when the way that we thought would lead us to the direction that we wanted to go doesn't end up leading us there. In fact, we don't know how to find the way back to where we last felt safe. And you're in this in-between place where I thought it was this way, but it's not, and I don't know how to get back to what's safe. That's the feeling of being lost. All of us have felt that in our gut at different moments, different times in our life. Lost is not a condemning word. It's not a, it's not a categorizing word. It's not like Jesus takes people and puts them in a box and says they're lost. Lost is a word of compassion. Lost is a word that describes people who are meant to be in relationship with the living God and who are not so lost describes what it looks like and what it feels like to be out of covenant relationship with the living God. We're lost. And Jesus says, the lost were and they are my highest priority. I came to seek and save them. And so as followers of Christ, we follow God into what he cares about. And if he cares about that, and if that's what drives Jesus, then that's going to be what drives us as followers of Christ. And I, I, think, I think, you know, to be honest with you, most of us know that. We know that. Statistically, when they, when they poll Christians, you know, when they talk about, like, this idea of sharing your faith with people, about 95 to 97% of Christians say that's something that we should do. Not only should we do it, that's something that is part and parcel with being a follower of Christ. Following Christ means we have an obligation or we have a responsibility, probably be a better word, to give witness or testimony to Jesus. That's our responsibility. But when you ask those same people, and, and they're us, well, I'm talking about people, but it's us. You ask those same people, how many people have you shared your faith with or invited to church? That percentage goes way, way down. So there, there's this disconnect, this disconnect. In fact, if you're in the millennial generation, this is really interesting. If you're like between 25 and 40, there are millennials, the 25 to 40-year-olds, 47% of them say that they think it's at least a little bit wrong to share their worldview or their belief with somebody who doesn't share their worldview or belief. Isn't that interesting? So there's this tension between like what we believe, like I believe that's what we should do, 
and what we actually practice and what we do. And, and I think there are, are so many reasons for that tension. I feel the tension all the time. I do. I feel the tension. And I think one of, one of the reasons why there is that tension there is not just the world that we live in, but because when we do evangelize, when we do what we're supposed to do and preach the gospel, doesn't it sometimes feel like this? Doesn't it feel like that? Doesn't it feel a little bit like Mike Myers just like doing an awkward product placement in the middle of a scene? You're like, where did that come from? It, it feels like we're trying to push something and we're trying to do product placement. And, and, and it feels like being able to evangelize doesn't quite capture the breadth of what God has done inside of me. I mean, how can evangelism describe or cap- how can I how can I how can I give that to you and make you feel or help you feel the internal work that God has done inside of me? I mean, I have a a relationship with God that is not based upon God just rearranging a couple things in my life and giving me just a little bit better life. I have a relationship with God which is based upon a radical transformation. I am a different person today because Jesus did something on the inside of me and freed me and continues to heal me and continues to carry me right now. There's things going on, and, and evangelism seems to almost kind of cheapen that. And it just feels like... How can I do justice to what God has done for me through that? And so in our world, what most of us retreat to is one of two different things. We either normalize Jesus or we privatize Jesus. We we normalize Jesus where our goal is to make Jesus seem as normal as possible. Like you can be a follower of Jesus and you really don't have to change much. In fact, you can be a follower of Jesus and not stick out at all. Jesus is just chill. He's cool, right? And so he's totally normal, and we elevate normal higher than Christ-likeness. And if somebody told you that you could follow Jesus and you wouldn't stick out, let me, let me just say, they didn't tell you the truth. Look, if, if God changes your life and you're different, then your life is going to be Different, right? I know you guys are like, this is a trick question. I know it. Our lives are going to be different. I'm not talking about obnoxious. I'm not talking about harsh and rude and tone deaf to our cultural, you know, communication. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm just talking about different. We're going to, in fact, they should be so different that they beg an explanation like, what is so different about you? That was the beauty of the early church. It was such a beautiful, loving culture and community that was so different from the world that they lived in. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. It was a safe place to be, but it was different. It was just different. But we try and normalize Jesus or we privatize Jesus. In our world where everything is tolerated, but somebody who has, uh, it's kind of weird, a Christian belief in that type of world where it can be very intimidating. Maybe you've you crossed that line with somebody and you've gotten into something. We tend to then retreat trying to just maintain our faith, survive in this world, and we keep our faith private. In other words, you do what you do, I'll do what I do. And we won't cross those lines. We'll just kind of keep them separate. And so we can either normalize our faith or privatize our faith. But regardless of whatever we do, if we go one of those two routes, we end up with a faith that is really powerless. It's powerless. It has no power to impact somebody's life. It doesn't become good news anymore. We just hide it away. We keep it away. We normalize it and tone it down so much that nobody really understands what it means to be a follower of Jesus anymore. And I want to encourage you that the Bible talks about something different. The Bible has a completely different understanding. I think one of the reasons why we, we do those two things is because something false that we believe. Uh, I, I used to think it a lot. And this is the myth, I think, that bounces around in our heads when we think about sharing our faith, that God doesn't show up until I show up, or he shows up when I show up. And that's not true. We somehow believe that God doesn't pursue somebody until I start pursuing somebody. And that's not true. Now, I was once told that I may be the only Jesus that somebody ever sees. And I understand the sentiment behind that. But I think that if Jesus wants to show himself to somebody and I say, God, use somebody else, God will, oh, God will move right past me to find somebody to do what God wants to do. He's bigger than, than my yes or no. 
but he invites me to be a part of it, which is the beauty and the crazy thing about it. So this is my friend Trey. When I first moved here to Hawaii, Trey was our kids' first soccer coach. And uh, my, my kids are now junior in college, so this was a long time ago. And Trey, we invited Trey to church, and after that first soccer season, I didn't see him again for years. And i got to be just completely honest with you. I would only pray for him periodically, and it was not consistent or powerful at all. But God was showing up in Trey's life even when I wasn't. God was pursuing him even when I wasn't. About four years later, my wife ran into his wife at the place where everybody reunites with each other, and that's in the frozen food section in Costco. And so that she ran into her wife, his wife. I believe it was God just saying, hey, look, you weren't active in their life, but that didn't stop me from being active in their life. And she invited him once again after four years. And then about three weeks later, they show up on Easter Sunday just because they had something going on in their life. And here, here's what I learned through this whole process. Eventually, Trey came to know the Lord, and he came to know the Lord when I wasn't praying for him, and he came to know the Lord when I wasn't, I was actually at the beach with my family when he came to know the Lord. He came to know the Lord when I was at the beach with my family. He didn't need me to show up in order for God to show up. God show, showed up way before I ever showed up. God was pursuing him way before I ever started pursuing him. God was loving him and wooing him into relationship with him way before Greg ever showed up. God had already showed up. And the reason why is because God is not giving to you and I a divine obligation called evangelism. He is giving to you and I a loving invitation to join him into what he is already doing in people's lives. We think that God has stopped pursuing, that Jesus stopped pursuing humanity, and he's kind of taken that burn and go, okay, it's all up to you, and dropped it in our lap. Now, if that's the case, then I'm afraid. And I think most of us live our lives afraid, like we're going to mess up something so bad if I do this because it all depends on me. And God's going, it doesn't all depend on you. It depends on me. I've been doing this way longer than you have, and I've never stopped. And so one time Jesus, he clarifies this, and whenever Jesus talked about, metaphorically, he called it the harvest. And that just meant the lives of people that he wanted to be in relationship with him. One time when Jesus saw the crowds, he was just, look, can you imagine? Jesus is looking in the face of people who are broken and who are hurting, and his heart is just breaking for them. And he had compassion. Literally, that word compassion in the Greek, it means like he was moved at the level of his bowels. I mean, his innards were just like torn when he saw this because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful as they're looking. And he says, but the workers, they're few. Ask the Lord of your harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. Notice what Jesus doesn't ask his disciples to pray. He doesn't ask his disciples to pray that God would pursue lost people. Because that's what God does. He is the one who leads the 99 to go after the one. He is the doctor who looks for the sick. He is the one who is seeking and saving the lost. He's always been that one. He will always be that one. So Jesus doesn't pray that we would pray that God would pursue the harvest. He's doing it already. Here's what he does pray. He prays that you and I would recognize what he's already doing and that we would join him in doing it that we would see where he's working and that we would go to where he's working and we would be involved with him in it. He gives us an invitation, not an obligation. This is not take Jesus where Jesus is not. This is go to where Jesus already is and join with him in doing what he's already doing. That's what this is. And the word that we're using is, is a real simple word. It's invitation. It's inviting people. It's what Philip did with Nathaniel. It's just come and see. It's a simple idea of invitation. This is how the good news is spread throughout the world, always has been, always will be. So Jesus didn't just drop this bird. So we can just kind of go like, thank God. 
It doesn't just all depend on me. God is pursuing. He is working even before I do. Thank God for that. So Jesus goes on in this same type of idea. There is the concept that we have, and I I think we do it a lot. If you're a Christian, maybe you pray this. You pray for God to pursue lost people. God is already doing that. And so Jesus tells his followers this often. He says this, open your eyes. Open your eyes to see the fields that are already ripe, that there is already a harvest. Now, when he says this, it's really important because think about this. He's walking through a place called Samaria. And I don't know if you know about Samaria, but Samaria was mixed with people who were considered lesser than the Jewish people. They were considered people who weren't worshiping God right. They were considering people, considered people who didn't serve God in the right way. So if God is anywhere not working, it's in Samaria because they're not doing the right things. And Jesus, can you imagine this? As he's walking through the fields of Samaria, he's saying to them, open your eyes and see. God is active. Open your eyes and see that even right now, God is working where you don't think he's working. Where you can't imagine him working, he is already working. The fields are ripe for harvest. And your Samaria, my Samaria, it's your workplace. You walk into your workplace and you go, there ain't no way God is in this workplace. And I think God would say, Jesus would say, put his arm around you and go, open your eyes. See where I'm already at work. See where somebody is about to get a divorce. See where I'm already. You can't possibly be, no, no. I'm at work right there. That mother on the playground trying to talk to that woman who's trying to corral her kids and about to lose her brain, we're going, there's no way God can be. Because here's what we think. We think God is at work in the places where we think God is at work, right? Like when you come to church, we kind of have an expectation. Our eyes are open. God, I think you're at work here. When you go to a small group, when you go to a prayer meeting, when you go to what you, you know, you name your Christian flavor, when you go to that, we're going, okay, God's working there. But what about in your, in your work situation? What about when you walk into the gym and you see that same guy at the counter who looks like he hates life and he can't wait to get out of this job, but he doesn't know what to do? What about there? Is God working there? Yeah. Jesus would say, oh, that's where you need to lift up your head, open your eyes, and look, because I am right there. And I am inviting you to come along with me to do what I'm already doing and to go where I'm already going. That's where God is working. In the places oftentimes where we have no expectation. But everything changes when God opens our eyes and we begin to live with an expectation that God, you're not just, because human beings, we're really good at compartmentalizing and saying, okay, God, this is where you work and this is not where you work. And Jesus just takes his big dry erase and goes, okay, let me just change all of that for you. Lift up your eyes and look to your Samaria and in the place where you think I'm not working on your, how could you be working with, with my military buddies? How could you be working with that person, that, that, that friend? For some of you, your, your Samaria is that friend that, that you haven't talked to in a long, long time. And you haven't talked to them in a long, long time because something happened in your relationship and you don't want to talk to them in a long time. It's that, that sibling that you have that whenever they come over, you never talk about this thing because you don't even like to talk with them about things that you know are going to get them upset or just because you got something going on with them. And Jesus would say, that's your Samaria. And you go, there's no way you could be working there. And God says, no, 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 no. That's exactly where I'm working. Lift up your eyes and see. That is your harvest field right there. That is your harvest field. And so Jesus invites us into this invitation to come and see, to do what Philip did with Nathaniel. An invitation is, it's powerful. Invitation is that thing that opens up our hearts and brings people into the kingdom of God. Invitation is that thing that helps us share with other people what we've experienced. Invitation is what Raina, who is a a high school senior at Kalani, has been doing for a long, long time. She's just been inviting her classmates to come and see because she wants them so badly to experience what she's experiencing. And so just recently, two of the guys that came and saw Connor and one of the coolest names ever, Jet. Connor and Jet just gave his life to Christ because somebody risked, moved beyond their comfort zone to say to somebody, 
Just come and see. Yeah. Just come and see. Man, I, I pray that we would be that kind of a people, that we would be that kind of a church. So let me just ask you, and, and you don't have to answer, just think about this. Are you a person of invitation? Are you? I believe God wants to make us all people of invitation. Why wouldn't we be? We're following the leader who was continually inviting people who seemed the least obvious to be a part of this community, to be a part of the community. Man, what a joy, what a privilege to be able to do the same thing. In fact, if, if you've gone through the 12-step program of AA, which is actually based on the Bible, bi biblical community of AA, or what we do here is called Celebrate Recovery. It happens every Saturday night at 6 o'clock right here on campus. One of the tenets of AA, one of the tenets of Celebrate Recovery, one of the essential aspects of it is invitation. The last one, 12, is spread the word. Share what's happened in your life and invite people to experience freedom. It's not just like if you want extra credit in AA or you want extra credit in Celebrate Recovery or with God. It's not just for extra credit. It is considered an essential part of your healing and your wholeness is to be able to take your experience and share it with other people and invite them to experience freedom with you. It is an essential part of our formation and of our shaping. What? This simple idea of invitation. And when you look at the early church, when you look at the growth of the early church, the astronomical and, and literally the statistical growth of the early church, the statistical growth of the early church outpaces any entity that has ever existed um, from the beginning of time till now. And there are two key components of this. And there was growth that transcended borders of culture, transcended borders of race, social, economic status, class, people group, all different people group growing at an astronomical pace. And there were two things that, that qualified it to do this. Number one was an incredible love for each other. They were just loving each other to the point where they were sacrificing their own means to serve one another. And then the second thing was a radical invitation into the community. A radical love for those that were in the community and a radical invitation for those who were not yet in the community into the community. Those two things, something as simple as come and see, resulted in this astronomical growth of the church a radical love for those within the community and a radical invitation for those who are not yet in the community. Now, what will it take for us to be a radical presence of invitation? There, there is just one thing. And my goal today is not to inspire you. It is definitely not to guilt you or just tell you try harder, although that's what some of you are thinking right now. Some of you are like, man, I, I'm just, I can't wait to get out of here. Some of you are like, I can't wait to try harder. And that's not what I'm trying to say because there's only one thing that will help you and I be an invitational presence, and that is this word, love. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that will move us beyond what is comfortable for you and I to take a risk for somebody else. That is the only thing that will sustain. That is the only thing that will continue to move us past our comfort zones, our places where things feel safe and secure, into that place where we're actually risking for somebody else. There's only one thing, and that is love. Inspiration will fade away. Willpower will burn you out. And guilt never leads to real redemption. It just never does. There is only one thing that does that, and that is love. Love that we receive from God and love that we give out and that we live through. Love is the only thing that is going to give you the energy to go back to that relationship, that friendship. You know, you got that person that's sleeping on your couch and you're like, man, now they're bringing their boyfriend or their girlfriend. They're starting to take over your home and you got no more energy for them. Love is the only thing that will cause you to be able to move through the discomfort of all of that, to be an invitational presence. Love is the only thing. Love is the only thing that will cause you to risk being uh, mis misunderstood, that will risk being rejected, that will risk just the pain and the discomfort of actually being an invitational presence. 
and know that it's worth it. Love is the only thing that can do that for you and I. It is the only thing that can move us to become the people of invitation that God has created us to be, to be those that say, come, come and see, come and see. And following Jesus will always lead us in this direction because once we stop doing this, we begin to forget something huge. We begin to forget that the gospel actually is good news, that there actually is a God who is pursuing and loving and drawing people to himself. And then this idea that Jesus gives of the 99 leaving the one, th- this is a, a form of spirituality that is a little bit different, I think, than oftentimes we approach spirituality. Now, Jesus is basically saying, here's the logic behind it. There are 99 that are safe together. They're able to nurture each other. They're able to care for each other. They're able to create safety with each other. And Jesus says, the shepherd, however, because he loves that one, is willing to risk everything to go and find that one and bring that one back into the safety of the community. And oftentimes when we think about church, when we think about being a follower of Christ, especially in our world where, you know, things are, can be aggressive, things can be maybe, I don't know, intimidating, we kind of retreat to the place where we would rather be safe with the 99 than to take the risk with the one. And we just try and, 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 man, if I could just leave this earth with my faith intact and my conviction intact and, and my marriage intact and my family, if we could just make it out of here because this world is a big, bad, dangerous place, then I'd be good. And I think Jesus is trying to continually, continually remind us that this world is not a dangerous place. You and I, we are the dangerous ones. We are the dangerous ones. We are the ones whose feet are firmly planted in a kingdom that will never fade away. We are the ones who have the gift of eternal life with God. There's nothing, what can anybody do to you? You've already died in Christ to your sin and been made alive. You're you're a dead person walking. Nobody can do anything to you. You and I are the dangerous ones. You have the victory that overcomes the world. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit power. God has given you and I everything that we need to succeed and have life in this lifetime. You're not on the defense. You and I, we are the dangerous ones. We have a gift to give. Jesus wants to continue to remind us that this world is not a dangerous place. We are the dangerous ones because of Christ that lives in our life. And so he's continually inviting us, inviting us to come out with him. Because the ultimate thing that heaven does celebrate, heaven celebrates when somebody comes back to God, when somebody comes into a relationship with God. This is how it's described in Luke uh, 15, 7. It says, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous who do not need to repent or who don't think they need to repent. And he says, in the same way, I tell you, there's more rejoicing. I mean, think about this. There's like a celebration going on every time somebody comes back and is restored into relationship with God. And it all happens just because somebody goes, come and see. I want me and I want you and I want us together to live lives where heaven is celebrating, not where heaven is silent. But in order for that to be the reality, then every once in a while we need to regularly look at somebody and just say, Come and see. Come and see. And I I know what you're thinking, but what happens if I mess up? Somebody coming to relationship with Christ is never going to be based upon the perfection of your presentation of the good news of Jesus. Nobody that I've ever led to Christ has come to Christ because I did an airtight, I answered all their questions and left no room for doubt. I didn't. There's no way I can do that. Here's what I did. Come and see. Sometimes I don't even know how to explain it. That's a great question, but come and see. Just an invitation into relationship with Christ, an invitation into a small group, an invitation to have coffee, an invitation to come to church, an invitation to come and serve on property. I can't tell how many people we've invited just to come and serve on property. You don't have to come to church. Just come help us out. Guys are like, I'll do that. Just come and see. Because if you come and you see, then you will not walk away the same. If you come and just believe something I said, then somebody can come along and talk you out of it. But when you come and see, then you're changed. 
And Jesus was continually inviting people. He was an invitational presence. He came to those who were. People said there's no way that God could be working over those prostitutes. There's no way that God could be working with those tax gatherers and sinners. There's no way that God could be working there. And Jesus said, come and see. And he invited those who were, felt like they were in the wrong body to come and see. And he invited those who were just frustrated with their marriage and wanted to quit to come and see. And he invited the mother who feels like she's failing every day to come and see. Come and see. And he invites us not to carry this divine obligation of evangelism, but to partner with him and to open up our eyes and just join with him in this invitation to come and see. Now, at the end of this, when Philip said to Nathaniel, come and see, here's what Nathaniel said. Nathaniel came to this conclusion after meeting Jesus. And this is what we'll close with. He says this. Nathaniel came and he said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. What is this? He realizes something about Jesus. His eyes are opened up, and Jesus introduces him to the God he didn't know that he knew, or he didn't know that, you know what I'm trying to say. He didn't know that he needed. There you go. He introduced him to the God who restored him in relationship with the God that he didn't know that he needed. And he brought him back into the family that he didn't know he was a part of. There's, what word do we have to describe this? I'll tell you, the word that Jesus used to describe this is salvation. This is what Jesus calls salvation. Salvation. Salvation is something that not we initiate, but that God initiates because he is always pursuing. He is always seeking. He is always drawing people to himself. And salvation is this thing where this God who is the king of the universe, who is the king of Israel, humbles himself and he comes down into our earth. And he engages in our gritty, nasty, dirty reality. He doesn't shy away from it. He actually comes into it. And salvation is not cheap. Salvation acknowledges the world that we live in. Salvation acknowledges our terminal problem, terminal problem that you and I are all sinners. And because of our sin, we experience death, death of soul. And because of that death of soul, we are eternally separated from God. And salvation acknowledges that reality that is true for all of us. And it also acknowledges the internal reality too, the internal reality that your life and my life is just a combination of things, different things, resentment and fear and things that we can't overcome and aloneness and insecurities and things that are regrets in our life. We're just a combination of terminal problems and internal problems and salvation acknowledges all of those and looks it straight in the eyes and it invites God into the middle of all of that. Salvation doesn't run away from death. It actually moves towards death. And Jesus dies on a cross in our place. And when he does that, because he does that, you and I, we don't have to just try and find a way to escape all of the terminal and internal realities. We have a way to draw near to those and draw near to Jesus who takes all of that on himself and instead, instead he extends to you and I life. Now, think about this. This is not just any kind of life. This is life that never ends. This is the life that we were created for. This is the experience of life in worship and service to God that you and I were made for, and it is a brand new future. That is so good. That is so amazing. That The only word that Jesus could find, and Jesus puts words on it, he calls it salvation. And it doesn't just end with us. Jesus not only wants to bring salvation into our lives, he invites us now not just to be perpetually rescued, but he invites us to partner together with him in rescuing other people and bringing this good news to other people. It's not just about us. It's about you and I having the ultimate honor and dignity. I mean, can you imagine God says, I want you to join me in rescue, and I want you to join with me in inviting people to come and to see. 
And we get to join with him. And it doesn't just end there. It doesn't end until God says it's done, until God has created a brand new heavens and a brand new earth. And he brings down a brand new city that he will populate with redeemed people who have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, who is the only worthy one who died in our place on a cross so that he could present you and I before God. People from every nation, every language, every tribe, every social economic status where we think God is working and where we can't imagine God is working. He says, I'm going to bring all of those together and populate this city with them. And then I will not even put a sun or a moon there because I will be the light and I will light it forever and ever and ever because my presence will be with you in this place forever. And I will be your God and you will be my people and we will live together and I will wipe away every tear and death will be no more and there will be no more mourning. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more pain and I will make all things brand new not just for a moment, but you will never, ever run out or fade away. Now that is good news. That is good news worth receiving, and that is good news worth sharing. And I mean, that is good news so good that there are no words for it. But Jesus gives us a word. He says, that's salvation. That's what salvation is. And the way into salvation is invitation. You and I are here this morning because somebody said to us, come and see. Come and see. Pray with me this morning. Father, we are, Lord, we're blown away at your goodness. And we're grateful, Lord. We're grateful this morning, God, that you pursued us, that you sought after us. Lord, that you loved us. And God, we're thankful that you brought somebody into our lives that invited us to come and see. Lord, many of us are here this morning. In fact, as I say that, there's a face that pops up in your mind. For me, I had so many different people. I had a fourth grade Sunday school teacher that invited me to come and see. But it wasn't until I was in college. I met a woman who didn't even know me. And she risked what I think about her. And she said, Greg, I'm inviting you to come and see. And I went. And I saw. And God changed my life. The God who was pursuing me before that moment So in this moment, can you just thank God for the person in your life that just invited you to come and see? We just thank God for that person that they risked, Lord, the invitation and the awkwardness and even their own discomfort to make that invitation to us. Thank you for them. Lord, bless them. And I want to pray for us, especially those of you who say, you know what, I want to be an invitational presence. I want to be somebody who regularly remembers the goodness of God by inviting people to come and see. When we forget that, we just forget that the gospel really is good news. And we forget that God is always pursuing, He's always acting. So if that's you this morning, you're just going, God, I, I'm just, wh- whatever is in my mind, whatever's in my heart, Lord, I pray that you would fill me instead with your presence. And Lord, make me an invitational presence. You just lift your hand if that's you. Just lift your hand if that's you. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray that that, that just be the heart of our church, Lord we would be this kind of a people, Lord, and that you would use it and work through it, Lord, and that our eyes would be open, Lord. I think that's what I pray for most of all, God, that you would give us eyes to see, especially in the places where we pretty much have ruled out your presence. For some of us, that might be a workplace, an office. For some of us, that might be the gym. For some of us, that might be a team or a classroom. Surely you can't be there doing anything good. God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see what you're already doing and, Lord, the faith to be able to join you as you invite us to just partner with you in what you're already doing and where you're already going. I thank you for that, Lord. Jesus, 
powerful name. Amen. Hey, thank you for watching the Grace Honolulu YouTube channel. Hit that like button, and if you haven't already, please subscribe. You'll receive weekly content like sermons and worship music. Great stuff. Also, you can follow us on social media, and if you'd like to give, go to gracehonolulu.org. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing you next week right here online. God bless you.